Question one. Sonnet 18 is about how beauty and life fade away, but literature can live forever. Now, in the poem, it mentions itself. Do you think that this mentioning of itself adds to the argument? So here, uh, last two lines. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long as means as long as. So long lives this, and this gives life to thee. This refers to the poem, so it's talking about itself. 就是这个是提到自己. Uh, and the main argument of the poem is um, that beauty and nature fade and die, right? Line three, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. So yes, flowers are beautiful in May, but then the summer comes and the wind shakes and the wind is very rough and suval. So maybe the flowers will not survive. Line four, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. A lease is the contract you sign when you rent a house. Here it just means the time. Summer ends too fast. Line seven, every fair from fair sometime declines. This sentence order is a bit strange. It says every fair declines sometime from fair. Fair means beauty. So the idea is beauty will always one day fade away. By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. So beauty will fade away either by luck or you know bad luck or because of nature's course. Nature keeps going and beauty will fade. But, and here's the twist, line nine. But thy eternal summer shall not fade. It's using summer to compare uh, the addressee's beauty. Nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, And you will not lose your beauty. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade. Death will not be able to say that you are in his territory. So you will not die. When in eternal lines to time thou growest. So you will not die if you are added to eternal lines of poetry. So the question is, does the poem really have to mention itself to, to strengthen this point? Well, as it turns, so uh, a few groups took this question uh, and they mostly think that yes, it does add to the, to the effect. It does help make this point because it's talking about how if you are put in a poem, you will live as long as the poem, which might be forever. But by putting the poem itself into the poem, we now get to compare the poem with all of the other things that are in the poem. So we think about beauty, nature, things that fade, summer, things that fade. And then on the other hand, we have this poem which we are still reading 400 years later. So yes, it puts the poem on the same level as everything else, and it makes us feel how long this poem has lived. Uh, so yes, it, it does add to the effect, but it only works this way if we are still reading the poem. So when Shakespeare was writing this poem, he had no idea whether it would be true, whether we would still be reading it today. So in fact, he's kind of bluffing. But in this case, it worked because he's a very good poet.
OK, question two, the form of lines five to eight in sonnet 60. Does this help to prove this poem's point? So first of all, what is the point of this poem? Like as the waves make towards the pebbled shore, so just like the ocean waves hit the shore, so do our minutes hasten to their end. Oh, OK, so this poem is about how short life is. Hasten means move quickly. So our minutes move quickly to their end. Life ends so fast. Each changing place with that which goes before. Each minute, the subject is minute. Each minute changing place with that which goes before. In Chinese, we call this Chang Jiang Hou Lang Tui Qian Lang. In sequent toil, sequent means in order. In sequent toil, all four words do contend. So every um, minute is moving forward with every other minute. OK, and then lines five to eight. This is what the question is asking. Nativity, which means birth. Once in the main of light, so in the middle of day, the most obvious thing, uh, birth. Crawls to maturity, so now the person has grown up. Notice the verb crawl, panpa, because you know when, when you're born, you don't know how to walk. Crawls to maturity, wherewith, wherewith means with which. Uh, wherewith being crowned. So once you reach maturity, once you have grown up, crooked eclipses against his glory fight. So once you have grown up, you slowly have to fight against becoming crooked. The glory here means the glory of being fully grown up. And time that gave doth now his gift confound. So time gives and time takes away. So a few groups took this question and they said yes. This style does add to the argument. The argument is that life is short. And notice that these four lines are one sentence. We begin with birth and we end with time taking away its gift, so death. The transition between each stage of life is so fast. Birth crawling as a baby, reaching uh, middle age, and when you finally get to middle age, suddenly you become old. And you have to fight against old age, and then you die. One sentence. So yes, it does add to the argument very well. Not only do we understand what it's saying, we now feel the passing of time very quickly. Question three, 73, why is line two so unsure? What effect might this create? Line two, when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs. Bao means branch, shu zi. So when we think about this image, how many yellow leaves do you see? We don't know because it says, or none or few. It's unsure. Why is it unsure? What effect is it trying to create? The key is in line five. In me, thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west. So when you look at me, you see the day after the sun has set, but it has not yet grown completely dark. After the sun has already gone down, but it's not yet completely night. Death's second self uh, means the night. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie as the deathbed whereon it must expire. When you look at me, you see the glowing of 
a past fire. Now there are only ashes of youth. And ultimately, this fire will be extinguished just like life will die. So, you see, can now, this is the Yujing Yixiang. So, what is this poem about? It's about dying. So, now that we know the point of the poem is about dying, does this line two add that uh, to that effect? Yellow leaves are already leaves that are dead. Technically, um, but if they're still on the tree, we think maybe it's not completely dead. Only when the branch is completely empty of leaves do we really think about a dead tree. In, the, in English, we call this the dead of winter, Sendong. So is it a few leaves? Is it no leaves? Is it is the person still alive or is he already dead? We don't know. Somewhere in between, not alive, but not completely dead, dead. And that is the effect that this poem is trying to create. A few groups also took this question and they ag agreed that this is probably the effect. The whole poem is not about death, it's about the process of dying almost being dead. Uh, and so this image helps us to, to feel that process. We're not all the way there, but almost. And the twist in this poem is very interesting. This thou perceivest. So you can see this. You can see that I'm almost dead, which makes thy love more strong. To love that well, which thou must leave ear long. Ear means before. So because I'm almost dead, you love me especially much because we love things that we're just about to lose. Okay, question four. Oh, this one is a popular question. Is the relationship in this poem healthy or unhealthy and why? So let's look at this. When my love swears that she's made of truth, I do believe her, though I know she lies. That she might think me some untutored youth. Untutored, a tutor is a teacher. So untutored means uh, someone who doesn't know a lot. Someone who has not been to school, does not have a lot of knowledge. She might think me some stupid young guy, basically unlearned in the world's false subtleties. Someone who does not know, in English we call this the ways of the world. In Chinese we say this person ru shi bu shen. Thus vainly thinking that she thinks me young. Uh, so the subject of this sentence is I. I vainly think, vainly means uselessly, think that she thinks that I'm young. So basically, I hope, I imagine, I fantasize that she thinks I'm a young guy. Although she knows my days are past the best. Simply, which means stupidly, I credit her false speaking tongue. I believe her when she lies. On both sides, thus is simple truth suppressed. So she lies about something, I believe her. I lie about my age, and I think she believes me. So both sides. It's mutual, hu xiangde. Line nine, twist. But wherefore says she not she is unjust? Wherefore means why? So uh, why doesn't she say that she is unjust, unfaithful? And wherefore say not I that I am old? And why don't I say that I am old? Why don't we tell the truth? If we both know the truth, why don't we say the truth? And the answer is in line 11. Oh, love's best habit is in seeming trust. The best kind of loving appearance or relationship is in seeming trust. Looks like trust. 
I guess today we would call this a uh, tacit agreement, mo qi. And age in love loves not to have years told. So like if you really love me, you won't ask me my age. Conclusion, therefore, it says therefore, it must be the conclusion. I lie with her and she with me, and in our faults by lies we flattered be. So the last line means uh, we flatter each other by lying to each other. But line 13 is a pun. To lie with somebody means to not tell them the truth, but it also means to have sex with them. So this is uh, in footnote 5. It says uh, the obvious sexual pun also in lines 13 and 14. So this is what it's talking about. So this relationship, right? They don't tell each other the truth about some things, even though they both know what the truth is. And the speaker says this is because a truly loving relationship has the appearance of trust. And anyways, we love each other. We both agree we have great sex. What's the problem? So most groups that took this question say that this is an unhealthy relationship. Because a truly loving relationship should be based on the truth, not on lies. And you know what? I agree. The question here is, is this a truly loving relationship? Are they going to get married and live together forever? Or do they just want to have sex with each other? Because if it's not a truly loving long term relationship, then maybe this level of honesty is fine for them. If they both think it's OK, uh, maybe it's not a bad thing. So another group gave an answer, which uh, which is um, other people might think it's unhealthy, but these two people think it's OK, so for them it's OK. Now there's a bigger question. If they truly think this is OK, if the speaker thinks that this is OK, why did he say this poem? Why does the poem exist? Um, it does seem like in, in English we say he doth protest too much, and we'll get to the poem where this comes from later in the semester. In Chinese we say, right? Why does he write this poem? Maybe he wants to believe that this is fine and this is healthy. Maybe he really does love her. And he wants to keep the relationship. So he's trying to convince himself. No, 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 this is fine. I can take this. This is OK. Like if you think about it, the woman or uh, not the woman, sorry. Yes, the woman, she the woman is lying about being faithful. A pretty big thing. The speaker is lying about his age. Which is not as big a deal. So when the speaker says, you know, she's lying about cheating, I'm lying about my age, we're the same. Not really. It's not really the same. So it does seem like the speaker is writing this poem to try to convince himself that it's fine because he really does uh, love her, even though maybe because she's not faithful, he, he's, he, he doesn't dare tell her that he loves her. So like he is hopelessly in love with the wrong woman. Question five, compare Shakespeare's sonnets with Sydney's. How are they similar? How are they different? Cool. So if you remember from last week, we read five of Sydney's sonnets. They were all from the male point of view about loving a woman, how loving this woman made him better, made him uh, want to flirt with her. And also when he had to leave her, she became sad. And so he became happy that she was sad because that means she did love him back. 
something like that. In this week's five poems, we had poems about the fading of beauty. We had poems about dying, had poems about cheating. It does seem quite different, right? Sydney is talking about a relationship between two people, a loving one sided relationship. Shakespeare is using imagery and the form of the poem to talk about deeper ideas like time passes so fast. Uh, and when he does talk about relationships, it's not about two specific people. It's about a kind of relationship. 就即便讲一段关系, so yes, love does appear in Shakespeare's sonnets, but the, the love is not a specific love between two people. Shakespeare seems to be using love to help him develop his ideas. So we usually say that Shakespeare's sonnets are more about the ideas and Sidney's sonnets are more about the emotion and the relationship. Do you think that makes sense? Yeah, OK, good. My uh, question six, how can you tell these were written in the 16th century? So let's go to page two of the handout. Sonnets. Actually, can we save some time and just say the answer is the same as last week? Because last week was also sonnets. This week is sonnets. And, you know, we have the added Shakespeare, 16th century. Uh, although you cannot, again, on the exam, you cannot say because the writer is Shakespeare. So this is the 16th century. Sorry, I'm moving a bit fast because there's more to cover this week. Next week, we are entering the 17th century and we're going to read poems by John Donne. I introduced the 17th century and John Donne last week um, for scheduling reasons. Um, basically, she is not using this class to do EPT in the class, but she is not going to be able to do it. If you are going to be able to do it, I will not be able to do it. So I will not be able to do it in the next week. I will not be able to do it in the next week. Sorry, I know it's a little confusing. So next week, the poems will be from the 17th century, but now I'm going to introduce the 18th century. Sabasaji, so please turn to page 11. The 18th century of English literature or British literature begins after the end of the English Civil War. Charles II, son of Charles I, becomes king, he again follows his father and his grandfather in demanding that the king is the most important person in the country and he can spend his money however he wants. So the reign of Charles II is when the king spent loads and loads of money on like parties, banquets, mask performances. So on the one hand, lots of culture and cultural events at court, which is good. On the other hand, the king spending a lot of the people's money, not good. Uh, then he dies. 1685, James II becomes king. He is also Catholic. So like in this period of um, uh, British history, the, the oscillation between like Protestant king and Catholic king and Protestant king and Catholic king was kind of a headache. People who lived through two different kings were never sure exactly how open they could be about their religion because the changes came so fast. In this period, the focus is on the Enlightenment, Xi Dong. So, for example, in 1687, Isaac Newton wrote his Principia Mathematica. Uh, this is Newton the Shu Shui Ren Li. This is where he explained gravity, Wan Yu Ying Li. But people forget Newton was also an alchemist, Lian Jing Shu Si. He believed in all sorts of weird stuff in addition to science. Uh, in fact, some people think he's such a brilliant scientist because he was willing to consider many different ideas. Some of them were great ideas, like white light includes light of every other color. 
白光包含所有光谱的颜色 ，was also discovered by Newton. Um, but then he also had other weird ideas. Um, and by the way, like the story about how you know Newton was hit on the head by an apple, not true. He was sitting in an apple orchard and he saw apples fall, but the apple did not hit him on the head. That's kind of too perfect. So the Enlightenment, this is when uh, people started thinking about the scientific principles of everyday life. Uh, right, so here's the third thing, scientific method, uh, observation, hypothesis, experiment, analysis, and then observation, hypothesis, the scientific method. And skepticism, so when people tell you this, is it true? In this uh, period, people started to think whether the ideas that were taught them, that they learned in school, really are true. Now, even though this is the period of the Enlightenment, religion was still important. For the longest time, up to, I think, the 20th century, religion was very important in uh, Western culture. Even today, if you ask the Vatican, Fanti Gang, they have a, a scientific department. You know, Gang, you're Why? Because they say that um, God is the explanation for everything that science cannot explain. So they have combined science with religion. They can uh, help push science forward. But at the same time, they say everything else is religion. So even during the Enlightenment, religion was still important. Another way to think about this is, sure, you can learn more about the world. And you can learn more about how the world works. But why does the world work this way? And now that we have this knowledge, who should we think? What should we do with it? The answer to these questions for them was a religious answer. Why is it like this? God created it like this. Who should we thank? God. What should we do with this knowledge? Go out, conquer the world, and spread our religion. So religion is still important in this period. Um, we also have the beginnings of uh, what today we call feminism. So previously, there had been women who wrote. There had been women who played important parts in uh, politics, especially from behind the scenes. But here we see the beginning of the widespread idea that even women should have an education. So at this point, women were still not equal to men, but some people started to see the value in improving women's education. And so along with these new ideas about women, we had a new philosophy called sentimentalism. This, today, the word sentimental in English means uh, to, be to, uh, to be controlled by emotions more than rationality. That is not what it used to mean. And that's why there is this parenthesis, cult of sensibility. In the 18th century, sensibility meant something like empathy. Uh, today, we say empathy is if you can stand in someone else's position and you can understand their perspective. Sensibility means everybody has the same human nature everybody is different but underneath that difference everybody is the same and so uh if everybody is basically the same then we should all feel similar emotions and have similar ideas when we see similar things uh, our emotional responses and our intellectual responses will be similar, is the idea. Um, so this is where emotions get brought into 
thinking and philosophy. Because not only is reason the same, emotions are also the same. So like uh, in philosophy and math, we use reason, li xing, because it's the same for everybody. Right? If I say one plus one equals two, you're not going to say one plus one equals five because reason is the same. But in this period, they thought that emotions are also the same. If you see uh, a kid fall into a well, shui jing, you're going to feel like he's in danger. And everybody will feel similarly. Now today we know that's not true. Some people feel differently, but at the time this was the main philosophy. And so if this is true, then we get social movements like abolitionism. To abolish something means to end some kind of system. What system is abolitionism against? Slavery. If every human thinks similarly and feels similarly, then we should not have slaves because slaves are also humans. So this is the beginning of the movement against slavery in the UK. Uh, and it should be noted that the UK ended slavery earlier than the US did. Not yet, but sooner than the US. So because of these ideas, the literature of the period emphasized emotion and simple language. Early in the 17th century, they emphasized everyday language. Here, it's not just everyday, but simple language. If everybody is the same, then even people who have not been to school think and feel in similar ways. So we should not keep those people out of access to literature. Even people who don't have a lot of knowledge should be able to learn and enjoy literature. And so it's simple language. Now, again, simple language for them, not necessarily simple language for us. When we read it, it's still not exactly simple. Um, some, and in this period, new forms of literature appeared. We have uh, a more emphasis on comedy. Um, and comedy really grew into a big kind of drama with many different rules and traditions. We have satire, feng tzu wen xue. We have the beginnings of the novel in the West, xiao shuo, cang pian xiao shuo. And we have the Gothic romance. The Gothic romance is a kind of novel. It's a novel that it, it, today we call it horror, a specific kind of horror. If you think about Twilight, that's gothic romance. Vampire, but also love. Maybe you'll die and turn into a vampire, but if you do die and turn into a vampire, you can stay with the person you love forever. It's both. Um, in the traditional gothic romance, usually it is some helpless woman enters an abbey, Shodaoyuan, and discovers that all of the nuns are evil and depraved and sexually perverted, and she has to survive, and maybe some man will come and save her, that kind of thing. In 1688, uh, the glorious revolution happens. Remember, uh, we were talking about how these two kings were terrible kings, right? Especially James II, he was Catholic again. So finally, in 1688, the nobles of England, Guizhu, the nobles of England had enough. They did not want a Catholic king again. So they invited the relatives of King Charles II to come and invade England and turn the country back to Protestantism. And these relatives were William of Orange and Mary Stuart. They, I, I remember correctly, they were the king and queen of Holland, Holland. Orange is a place, not a color. He's not an orange king. Uh, so they reinvade England and they turn it Protestant again. 
and they also carry the war further into Ireland. 1691, James II. OK, so he lost in 1689, but then the, he retreated to Ireland. And so William and Mary invaded Ireland and they finally defeated James in 1691. So like this is one of the earliest times when Ireland plays an important role in English history. 1695, uh, the government censorship, 政府出版禁令, shifts to post-publication. So now, instead of submitting your work to the government and then getting published, you can publish first, and the government will then check to see if it's okay, and if it's not, then it will you know, ban the book. Now, of course, once your book is published, it's hard to ban it, right? 一旦出版了, so really what this means is that publication became more varied and open uh, and many more ideas were able to spread. 1707, the Acts of Union annex Scotland to form Great Britain. So even though King James I was king of both Scotland and England, he did not unite the two countries. That only happens in 1707. And the new country is called Great Britain. Even today, England plus Scotland equals uh, Great Britain. No, England, Wales, and Scotland equals Great Britain. 1710, England has its first copyright law. Before this, you could do, basically copy and sell whatever book you found. Um, but in 1710, the new law protects the, right, the, the rights of uh, authors. 1720, Robert Walpole becomes the first prime minister. Today, prime minister is an official job, but in, back in those days, all ministers were equal. There was no prime minister. And in fact, until very late in the 20th century, the prime minister was still in charge of one of the departments. 直到最, so when we say this dude became prime minister, what we mean is he was the first person to become much more important than the other ministers and basically had a more direct relationship with the king. After this point, uh, usually the king or queen would have a closer relationship to one of the ministers. 1755, Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language is published. This is the first general dictionary in English. Before this, we had specialist dictionaries for like the law or for medicine or for some kind of job. But this is the first general dictionary. Now, you know, it was the first dictionary. It was not a very good dictionary. <laughs> a lot of the definitions were kind of strange or biased because it was written by one person. There was no real evidence. It was basically whatever Johnson thought that was the definition. Um, but today, English dictionaries are written by everybody, basically. Do you guys know how English dictionaries are written? OK, so here's what happens. A company th decides we want to put out an English dictionary. They hire a bunch of experts. Each expert is in charge of a certain range of letters. Like this person will be in charge of A to C. The next person will be in charge of D to F and so on. Each person will then ask the public for evidence in order to build a definition. And the public will send in example sentences using each different word and then the editor will take this evidence uh, and come up with a definition that fits all of these examples. So how do we write an English dictionary? Not like Johnson. Johnson sat down, thought about it, and wrote it down. Too easy. Today, everybody helps to write the English dictionary. Um, but, you know, Johnson, he read a lot. He is a very knowledgeable person. We call him the literary giant of the 18th century. He's so famous, 
he had his own biographer. 他有自己的那个亲用传记家 And this dude named Samuel Pepys followed him around for the second half of his life. And the biography was called "Travels with Doctor Johnson." So it's not just like、uh, this is the story of his life. It's more like this is a diary of when I spent his life with him. That's how famous this guy is.、Um, so with the promotion of language, with simple、uh, literature, with simple language, with a dictionary out for everybody to use. There was a promotion of literacy, 识读率，提升。Ah,、uh, more and more people started to read. We had more periodicals, ah,、uh, 报章杂志 for daily reading. And when people began to read similar things, they started to have ideas. They started to talk about these ideas, and ah,、uh, slowly was created what today we call the public sphere, 公共领域 So, like today, we say the government, the industry, and the public. 公部门、企业部门，然后公众领域。This is the public sphere. And we also have the importance, the growing importance, of authors from the lower classes, 比较劳工阶级的 and women.、Uh, started to have writers who became famous. Even though they came from these unusual backgrounds, 1763, James Watt's first steam engine was invented. 蒸汽机，瓦特蒸汽机。You know, James Watt did not invent the steam engine. He、uh, improved the steam engine, but he improved it so much that it.、Uh, at first, the steam engine was just kind of fun. It didn't really do anything. But after James Watt, it became a useful tool, and that's why we remember his name and not the name of the people who actually invented the thing. 1775 to 1783 was the American Revolution. This was very painful for the British. The first time that the British lost a colony, and it's even more painful because they didn't lose the colony to the local people. The Americans in the American Revolution were British people who moved to America, so they lost their colony to their own people. In fact, the British were so pissed at this that they later fought another war with the U.S. in 1812, and they lost again. 1776 is when the Americans formally declared independence. 独立宣言 It's also when Adam Smith published *On the Wealth of Nations*, 富国论 Adam Smith is today known as the founder of modern economics, 当代经呃现代经济学之父 On the Wealth of Nations is when he、uh, tried to figure out what makes a country wealthy, what gets a country's economy going.、Um, So you know, today we think about economics. We think numbers and statistics and productivity, but Adam Smith is a product of the 18th century. His thought reflects the ideas of his time. His time was about emotion and sentimentalism. So even in *On the Wealth of Nations*. He still talks about how emotions affect different countries and how they do、uh, business, how they make things,、uh, and he argues. He talks about something called the invisible hand, kambujindaso, right, which is the free market. But he also talks about the limits of the free market. Many things that you cannot do by buying and selling something. There are many things that you still have to have a government to do. So even though he is the father of economics, his ideas can look quite different from what we think of as economics. And finally, the 18th century ends when Samuel Johnson dies in 1784.、Uh, that's how important he is. He's not a king, but when he dies, it is literally the end of an era. 时代的终结 Uh, the 19th century, sorry, 
the Victorian period begins in 1785, and we'll talk about that in... No, no, no. The Romantic period begins in 1785, and we'll talk about that in next week, I think. Okay, questions about the 18th century? Okay, so next week we're going to read two poems by John Donne. John Donne is famous for having very crazy, wacky, creative ideas. So today we read poems by Shakespeare that talked about ideas. But when John Donne talks about ideas, he makes very strange connections. We're going to read two of his poems next week. Uh, before next week, please read them before coming to class. Okay, that's it.